please remain standing for the reading of God's word. The scripture for this morning's message is Psalm 23. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Father, I, th I think the best prayer I can offer before we launch into a study of Psalm 23 this morning is what we just lifted our voices to sing together. Oh God, would you by your Holy Spirit turn our eyes to Jesus. If there is one who has gathered with us this morning who, is, who has never turned his or her eyes to Jesus in Repentance and faith, I pray that that would happen today. Oh God, and for all your children, all those who have already come to faith in Christ, we have beheld the glory and majesty of Jesus and we have run to him for mercy. Uh, would you give us just a fresh vision of what we've already seen? And what we already know. But we easily have our vision clouded. And we easily forget. So Holy Spirit, please work. Through the feeble preaching of your word. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. J. Robertson McQuilkin served as the third president of Columbia International University from 1968 to 1990. In the years leading up to his resignation in 1990, McQuilkin's wife Muriel was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Her symptom, symptoms worsened over time. Even though the school's board had arranged for a com companion to stay with Muriel, while Robertson went to the office, the, the situation continued to worsen. Here is part of what Robertson said in a letter he sent out explaining his resignation. Some of you have heard this before. I've, I've shared it on another occasion, but I want you to hear it carefully. Recently, it has become apparent that Muriel is contented most of the time she is with me, and almost none of the time I am away from her. It is not just discontent. She is filled with fear, even terror that she has lost me and always goes in search of me when I leave home. So it is clear to me that she needs me now full time. He continues, this decision was made in a way 42 years ago when I promised to care for Muriel in sickness and in health, health to, till death do us part. So as I told the students and faculty, as a man of my word, integrity has something to do with it. But so does fairness. 
She has cared for me fully and sacrificially all these years. If I cared for her for the next 40 years, I would not be out of her debt. Duty, however, can be grim and stoic. So there is more. I love Muriel. She is a delight to me. Her childlike dependence and confidence in me, her warm love, occasional flashes of that wit I used to relish so, her happy spirit and tough resilience in the face of her continual distressing frustration. I don't have to care for her. I get to. It is a high honor to care for so wonderful a person. While this is a stunning picture of a husband's Christ-like love for his wife, I want you to hear again what Robertson said near the beginning of his letter. Recently, it has become apparent that Muriel is contented most of the time she is with me and almost none of the time I am away from her. It is not just discontent. She is filled with fear, even terror, that she has lost me. After 42 years of marriage, even as Alzheimer's was wreaking havoc on her mind and body, Muriel knew this. As long as her husband was with her, she didn't have to be afraid. Friends, this beautiful story points us to something far greater. It's the central truth of Psalm 23. For the believer, no matter your circumstances, whether you're alone and suffering or discouraged and defeated, whether, whether you're in the midst of a brief trial or your mind and body are wasting away, there is something you can know for sure. Jesus has promised to be with you. And as long as Jesus is with you, you don't have to be afraid. Again, this is the message of Psalm 23, brothers and sisters. The good shepherd, the good shepherd knows you, he loves you, and he will never leave you. So don't be afraid. Please look with me at the text. The Lord is my shepherd, a psalm of David. As author David Gibson puts it directly and accurately in his excellent book, The Lord of Psalm 23, quote, this psalm in our Bibles, this psalm in our Bibles is there as an exquisite depiction of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. This psalm is an exquisite depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ. With this in mind, there are three words I want you to consider as we walk through Psalm 23 together. Provision, presence, and protection. Provision, presence, and protection. First, I want you to see the provision of the good shepherd. This is verses one through three. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name sake. This first section of Psalm 23 establishes the relationship that serves as the foundation for everything that follows. There is nothing impersonal here. The connection between a shepherd and his sheep is unique. The shepherd knows a lot about sheep in general, but, but he knows his sheep personally. He knows specific details about everyone. 
This is precisely why the shepherd sheep metaphor is used so predominantly in the New Testament to talk about the Lord Jesus and true believers. There is an intimacy that marks this relationship. Listen to the words of Jesus in John 10. This is how the good shepherd talks about the relationship he has with his sheep. And notice all the parallels between Psalm 23 and John 10. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Jesus can use this metaphor of the shepherd and sheep to describe himself and all those who truly believe in him. It is, it is both fitting and appropriate. Just as Jesus knows his sheep, his sheep know their shepherd. Listen, it is no small thing to be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. And if those words are true, and they are for every believer, then everything that follows in Psalm 23 is true as well. And it's true, listen, in a very personal way. Please notice that the good shepherd is generous and kind. The good shepherd is generous and kind, making sure his sheep have everything they need. That's what it means. I, I shall not want. I don't have want of anything. My needs have been provided for. Now, let me offer you a quick warning. Here's, here's something I think a lot of us m might do when we read this psalm. When we come to that phrase, I shall not want, which wonderfully announces that God provides everything we need, we read that and we just we just jump right into verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So here's my warning. Before we read, I shall not want, and jump to verse 2, let's first understand that, that maybe I shall not want should first point us back again to the phrase that came before it. The Lord is my shepherd. Don't miss this. If the Lord is your shepherd, then your greatest need has already been met. If the Lord is your shepherd, then your greatest need has already been met. In fact, this ought to fundamentally define you and everything about you. No matter what you might be facing, Whatever the suffering or difficulty, the diagnosis you didn't expect or that expense you didn't see coming or the relationship that just went sideways or the child that rejects the gospel or the depression that just won't lift or the anxiety that won't calm, 
Oh, friends, what remains true through it all? The Lord is your shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. And now, what kind of shepherd is he? Well, he is lavish and abundant in his provision. By his hand, we receive everything we need, both physically, verse 2, and spiritually, verse 3. Look at verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The good shepherd leads his sheep to a place where they have plenty to eat and where they can rest in safety. This again reveals the nature and character of the good shepherd. He is not irresponsible. He's not absent-minded. He isn't unaware of what his sheep need. This is a good reminder, especially as we face life circumstances where it's very difficult to see the purposes of God. Have you ever found yourself staring down some trial or difficulty and you, you can't figure out what God is doing? Maybe that describes where you are right now. In your confusion, friend, I think it's good to remember what kind of shepherd you have. Just as the children of Israel, when they were delivered from suffering and slavery in Egypt, they were, they were then brought through the dangerous waters of the Red Sea. And, and then what happened next? The waters were calmed and God's people were given rest. Where? Beside still waters. The good shepherd provides everything his sheep need physically, but also spiritually. Look at verse three. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In verse two, we find one emphasis and then a different one in verse three. If, if verse two is emphasizing physical nourishment and divine protection, then verse three is emphasizing spiritual refreshment and divine guidance. That phrase, restores my soul, it carries this idea. He gives the enjoyment of life to his own. He gives the enjoyment of life to his own. Brothers and sisters, the good shepherd desires for you to live the good life. And what is the good life? Well, it's, it's not a life void of suffering or difficulty. It's not a life of godless living through personal autonomy. In fact, the, the good life, according to the good shepherd, bears no resemblance at all to the good life as it's defined by most politicians and celebrities and social media influencers. Here's the good life according to the good shepherd. Walk in his way, the way of wisdom. Listen to and obey his every command. Treasure his word and live for his glory. That's the good life, according to the good shepherd. He leads his sheep in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In verses one through three, we see the provision of the good shepherd. Look now at verse four. I want you to see the presence of the good shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As we find throughout this entire psalm, the, the picture David is painting with his words is vivid. You can see it in your mind. 
uh, what he describes in verse 4. As the sheep follow the lead of their shepherd, sometimes the path will take them to green pastures, and sometimes the path will take them into dark valleys where life can get scary. Again, this is, this is a good reminder for us. Following the good shepherd doesn't guarantee a life without suffering and difficulty. In fact, this is actually a certainty. Every believer here will face various trials in this life, and barring the Lord's return, every believer here will also face death. And when this happens, you will battle fear. But the aim of this psalm is to comfort believers. So David reminds you that the good shepherd has the right equipment to lead his sheep through darkness and danger. He has a rod and a staff. When I was growing up, one of my favorite television shows was called MacGyver. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't, do yourself a favor and look it up. MacGyver was this guy who would carry out dangerous missions and he would thwart elaborate and evil plans and he would do this by using ordinary stuff in incredible ways. Here are just two examples. He once diffused a bomb with a paper clip and bubble gum. Another time he used a muffler, a gear shift knob, seat cushion stuffing, and a cigarette lighter to make a bazooka. <laughs> he somehow always had what he needed, no matter what challenge he faced. That's what we have here. The good shepherd is like the true and better MacGyver. <laughs> and if that's all you remember, I'm fine with that. <laughs> because if you really think about it, it's good. Again, imagine the scene in verse 5. The shepherd is leading his sheep through a dark and dangerous valley a valley surrounded by high ground where predators could watch carefully and in a moment they could attack. If this were to happen, the shepherd would use his rod, a heavy club, and he would beat back or even kill the attacking beast. But what might also happen, friends, as the sheep are, are led through the valley of the shadow of death? Well, they might become nervous and skittish. And they might be tempted in a moment of fear to take off, believing that the safest choice is to run. You see, this is where the staff would come in. The shepherd who, who loves and cares for his sheep would use his, his staff to keep the sheep from danger and to pull them back close. You see, a loving shepherd will lead his sheep sometimes by defeating enemies and sometimes through loving discipline. Both are good for the sheep. The good shepherd has everything he needs to guide and protect and love his sheep. And this knowledge can help drive away fear, even in the face of death, can't it? Well, friends, what is better? What is better than knowing that the good shepherd has all the right equipment? It's what we find right in the middle of verse 4. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. 
I want you to notice a change that has taken place in the language of this psalm. A few different Bible commentators point this out. In, in verses 2 and 3, the good shepherd is referred to in the third person, he. But now look at verse 4. The good shepherd is addressed in the second person, you. You. David Gibson writes, the meaning of the words, which I, I think we just intuitively sense, is that it is one thing to be able to say that someone is with me, but quite another thing to be able to turn toward that individual and address him personally by saying, you are with me. Friends, in your darkest hour, and in your deepest trials, there is nothing more comforting than this. Your good shepherd is with you. You can talk to him. You don't have to be afraid. He's not going anywhere. As one pastor put it, the darker the shadow, the closer the Lord. Provision, presence, and finally, please notice the protection of the good shepherd. We see this in verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. There's a striking transition between verse 4 and verse 5. The believer moves from the fear of death to a celebration of victory. That's the picture in verse 5. The good shepherd has become a conquering hero, and the sheep are finally brought to a place of peace and safety and abundant blessing. And it's only because the shepherd protected them every step of the way. No shepherd, no celebration. Now, even as the sheep have experienced the provision, presence, and protection of the good shepherd, there is something more. Let's make this personal, because it is. As you've traveled this journey of life with Jesus, you've sustained some bumps and bruises. Your suffering has produced some injuries. Does this describe your experience? as the good shepherd has now brought you safely to the banquet table or the place of peace and safety, here's, here's what he would do next. Warren Wearsby explains, the shepherd would examine the sheep as they entered the fold to be sure none of them was bruised, injured, or sick. For the hurting, he applied soothing oil. And for the thirsty, he took his large two-handled cup and he gave them to drink. This is the good shepherd. This is, this is what it looks like to be known and loved by Jesus. Now, friends, how does this wonderful psalm conclude? It concludes with a note of certainty. Verse 6. Surely, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's, here's how I think we should understand verse 6. When you and I, brothers and sisters, reach the end of our lives and we look back, 
especially at seasons of suffering or other unexpected circumstances that, that left us confused and afraid, here is what we'll see. We'll see that we were never alone. The good shepherd was with us. And because the good shepherd was with us, all that he is toward those he loves, this is what surrounded you every step of the way. The goodness and mercy of the Lord Jesus were always right there. You couldn't escape them. Maybe it didn't feel that way in the moment. But when you look back, you'll be able to see the goodness and mercy of Jesus in every situation and in every season of life. It's there. You see, it is the goodness and mercy of Jesus that will escort you all the way home. This is why the psalm ends with certainty. Because your perseverance isn't ultimately up to you. It is the result of the goodness and mercy of Jesus. That is the only reason. That is the only reason you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's why I love it when we sing, your goodness is running after me. Oh, it's so appropriate when we consider this psalm. When we began this morning, I shared the story of the McQuilkins. As we conclude now, let me remind you again how Robertson described why he was resigning his job to be with his wife, Muriel, as she suffered from Alzheimer's. As long as I am with her, she's not afraid. This is the message of Psalm 23. As long as Jesus is with you, you don't have to be afraid. Let's pray.